everyone and welcome. My name is Cara O'Sullivan and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Assistant Director of Continuing Education. Thank you for joining us for our final event of the semester. It's nice to be able to gather in person and also with our audience online via live stream. To our in-person guests, thank you for wearing your mask today. We ask that you kindly wear it at all times except when eating and drinking. As part of the ministry, as part of the mission of the School of Theology and Ministry, our continuing education program offers an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this with on-campus presentations like this one, as well as online courses, webinars, videos, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our STM online crossroad cor summer courses begin in July and in, are now enrolling. Courses include spiritual practices, teaching religion to children, and St. Mary of Magdala. Please visit our website, bc.edu slash crossroads for more information on our complete cor course offerings and how to enroll. Information on these courses and our summer programming will also be included in our follow-up email. We we'll hope you're able to participate. Uh, please be sure to check out the book table at the entrance to this space. Paulus Press is here with copies of Dean Stegman's new book available for purchase. Thanks to our presenter for granting us permission to videotape this presentation, including the Q&A portion. We're so grateful for the opportunity to extend the life of this lecture. Within about a month, you'll find the video posted on our Encore archi archive at bc.edu slash Encore. As mentioned earlier, during the program, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A, and there are two points to keep in mind. First, before you ask a question or make a comment, please wait for the microphone so the video can pick it up. And second, please know that if you do ask a question or make a comment, it will likely be part of the final video and may have a very long life. So just be sure that you're okay with that before speaking. For those joining our lecture virtually, please post your questions and comments using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. My colleague James will be able to share your questions and comments during the Q&A portion of this event. Now I invite Megan DeDios, Director of Continuing Education, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hey. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I have the honor of introducing our speaker this evening for his presentation, Text Less Traveled, What Would Be Missed Without Them? Thomas D. Stegman, a member of the U.S. Midwest Province of the Society of Jesus, is Dean of the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, Pro Professor of New Testament, and Professor Ordinarius in the Ecclesi Ecclesiastical Faculty at the STM. He was raised in Holdridge, Nebraska, and he's a graduate of St. Charles Borome Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia, and holds an MA in Philosophy from Marquette University, a Master's of Divinity degree and Licentiate in Sacred Theology and Old Testament from Weston Jesuit School of Theology, and a PhD in New Testament Studies from Emory University under the direction of Dr. Luke Timothy Johnson. Father Stegman is the recipient of many academic awards, including the American Bible Society Scholarly Achievement Award and the Aquinas Institute Fellowship at Emory University. He held the Reverend Francis C. Wade Chair at Marquette University in fall of 2010, and the Anna and Donald Waite Endow Chair in Jesuit Education at Creighton University in the academic year 2014 to 15. <clears throat> Father Segment has published widely and is the author of two books on 2 Corinthians, including a volume in the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture series. He is co-editor of Biblical Essays in honor of Daniel J. Harrington, SJ, and Richard J. Clifford, SJ, Opportunity of No Little Instruction. Father Stegman is the sole author of Opening the Door of Faith, Encountering Jesus and His Call to Discipleship, published in 2015, Written for Our Instruction, Theological and Spiritual Riches in Romans, published in 2017, and Being Formed in Loving Sacrifice, St. Paul Speaks to Seminarians, 2019. He wrote a book like commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans, which appears in the Paulus Biblical Commentary, of which he is one of the six co-editors. In addition to publishing in professional journals such as Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Novum Testamentum, and Theological Studies, Father Segman also writes for more popular venues, including Pastoral Review and Give Us This Day, to which he has been a frequent contributor. 
He co-authored a book on Lenten Reflections with Amy Ecke, not by Bread Alone. It was just published this year, and it sold over 280,000 copies. So well done, Father Stegman. I know I enjoyed reading the reflections during Lent. He regularly presides and preaches at weekend liturgies and has offered several Ignatian retreats throughout the country. In 2013, he represented his province at the 70th Procurator's Congregation of the Society of Jesus in Nairobi. In 2016, he was one of 212 delegates who were in Rome for the 36th General Congregation of the Society of Jesus. We are thrilled that he is here to discuss his new book, The Text Less Traveled, exploring Hebrews, the Catholic Epistles, and Revelation. Please visit the book table to purchase your own copy and then the other books that I mentioned. Um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our wonderful leader, Dean Thomas Stegman. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan. And as uh, Megan and Kara work their way to the back, I w need to say a very heartfelt thank you to the two of them and also to James Burriston, who's the fellow sitting at the table in the back. They are our continuing ed team and they've done a lot of work uh, making this event possible, so thank you. So I'd like to, we have some special guests here, and I'm going to switch this slide because I've dedicated this book to my medical team who have made it possible for me to be up in front of you right now. And I want to give, a, 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 one I think is still on the way, but some have arrived, and I want to introduce you to them. First, I will, and he just arrived. Thank you for coming, Dr. Shane Tengaturi, who is my radiation oncologist. And if you take a look at him, uh, one of the things I've uh, come to learn is Doogie Hauser is a real thing. <laughs> hey, here's a man I met uh, almost three years ago. And you know, these are fellows, or people, MD, PhD, I mean, you don't just, they don't hand those out after the high school diploma. Um, and I, uh, I teased him about how youthful, but I was also a little jealous. Um, and I learned from, I want to say two things, three things actually about Dr. Tangatori. He's an excellent, excellent teacher. And one of the things about being at a teaching hospital like uh, Harvard, the people taking care of you explain things so well in ways that I can understand and appreciate. Uh, another thing I want to say is I was waiting for him or just outside of his office and I heard one of his nurses refer to him as Dr. T. So when I came in to see him I said may I call you Dr. T and he agreed to that and I appreciate that and uh, made very clear he's not like a Mr. T. You remember old <laughs> Mr. T? He's Dr. T. Um, and I also learned that uh, he married, his wife is from St. Louis, and uh, I said, is she a Cardinal fan? He said, well, his father-in-law is a big Cardinal fan, so uh, that's always a good thing to have fellow Cardinal fans. So sitting to his left is my neuro-oncologist, Dr. Jose Ricardo McFallon Figueroa. Now that's a pretty long name, and after Dr. T gave me permission to go, Dr. T, I went to Dr. McFellan Figueroa and I said, is there any way we can shorten that? <laughs> and he said to me, my friends call me Ricky. And I said, may I call you Dr. Ricky? And he said, yes. So Dr. Ricky, who will, uh, has to leave early tomorrow to Puerto Rico, so I'm glad you're here. And he's just telling me that um, he has three grandparents still living. He's going to, to see them. And, I shared with him that uh, at my ordination, priest, I still had three grandparents living in his real blessing. And um, he's another one of the Doogie Hauser uh, <laughs> young fellows. And I remember expressing that, and I'm going to, go and talk to about Dr. Golby in a, in a second. Dr. Golby, who was, is a specialist and did a clinical trial with me that was very beneficial. She said to me, you are in great hands with Dr. Ricky. And I've certainly 
come to appreciate that fully. Um, my surgeon is signed, and I understand traffic's tough, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Timothy Smith, and I'll say just a few words about it. I met him a couple of days before my surgery, and Father Michael Bouton, the rector of the community, asked me, well, how did it go? And I said, I like him. I said, he's confident, but he's not cocky. He, he looks you in the eye. Now, I did find out he's a son of a minister. We talked a little bit about sermon and homily preparation. And uh, I found out he's from the Chicago area. And I said, oh, I said, I hope the fact that I'm a big Green Bay Packer backer isn't going to uh, impact the way you treat me. And he said, of course not. Now, when I woke up from surgery and looked in the mirror, I couldn't help but notice my staples formed the shape of a C on the side of my head. Uh, but that's just what he had to do. And he's such a skilled surgeon. And I've had the surgery, he used the same incision twice. You can't even see it. He's that skilled a surgeon. Um, and one other thing I want to say about him, and I'm trying to capture, notice I say, I've experienced uh, God's healing through my team. Um, when a second tumor emerged pretty near the site of the original tumor, and Dr. Ricky was tracking that very closely and consulting with the entire medical team, and Dr. Smith got on a Zoom call with me, and he said, uh, I really recommend that we remove that quickly. He said, if you were my brother, that's the advice I'd give. Then he paused and he said, I kind of think of you as my brother. And I, it's beautiful. Um, and that's the kind of care I'm receiving. And then I mentioned uh, Dr. Alexandra Golby. She convinced me to do a clinical trial with her. And I th was I the first patient in the Brigham and Harvard and it involved um, focused ultrasound. And, uh, and, what she, and again, another good teacher. She and I, I'm going to mention, well, let me mention Kim Noonan, who is the nurse for the Jesuit community, including the Faber community, who has spent a lot of time with me throughout this and accompanied me and explained things to me as well. We were together and Dr. Golby was explaining what she, her frustration was. We have something, I've learned more about my brain and about my blood than I ever knew from my biology classes. Um, the blood membrane, that barrier that protects our brain, from bad things getting in, but it also, in this, my case, where she says it often happens with cancer patients, it keeps the chemo out. And she said, that's one of her frustrations. So, she has this technology where she uh, temporarily breaches the uh, membrane so that the chemo can get to where it needs to go. And I'm, well, I can't prove it. I know I was a beneficiary. I, I benefited from that technology. Two of her team are here, Mary Beth Mandelo and Dr. Ricky, uh, Rick Torrio, who's a fellow with that, uh, Dr with Dr. Golby. I, I'm going to show a slide for just a second because the only hesitation I had about this trial, <laughs> Dr. Golby says, well, we put something on your head. It's kind of like a medieval torture contraption. And it's the base from which the halo gets put on. So I can honestly say I've had a halo. I have worn a halo, folks. <laughs> My colleagues might find that hard to say. I'm going to show you this just for a second because I don't want this on the internet forever. Uh, first of all, I got a free haircut every month for five months. And then, uh, there's Heather, I think it's Sarah, she is in the upper left. They're so good. Well, I don't really see those things going into my, there are four of these points. And literally screwed those things into my skull. And it was a good test for me to see how much pain I could endure and how tough I was. I, and the nurses were so good. Mary Beth was one and said, here, take our hands. You can squeeze. Cause, mm. And I said, where I come from back in the prairie, they give you a, a shot of whiskey and a bullet to bite when they do these kind of things. But uh, anyway, so 
I'm honored that my, and, and Kim, thank you for coming. Her husband, Brendan, is, is this. And if Dr. Smith comes, I will point him out. So let me now move to our presentation. And this might sound like a little shameless uh, <laughs> uh, self-advertising here, but this, the book that we're celebrating tonight, or talking about tonight, had two predecessors. One was a book called Opening the Door of Faith, and that was inspired by the Year of Faith that was proclaimed by Pope Benedict. And this book consists of chapters on each of the Gospels, and then one on Paul, which presents how each of the Gospels uh, reveals who Jesus is, how he calls us, and um, that was an idea actually given to me by one of my colleagues from Paulus Press, uh, Jose, or uh, um, I'm having a blank. Uh, Enrique Aguilar, thank you. Enrique, the intrepid Enrique Aguilar. Um, I was telling him, I was thinking about writing something. He said, write it for us. And, and I was very grateful. And after writing the commentary on Romans for the Paulist Biblical Commentary, which um, I remember my teacher, Luke Johnson, said to me at one point, he said, you're going to find out how much discipline you have when you write a commentary, because commentaries are both easy and difficult to write. It's easy because you know what the next thing is. It's the next verse, the next passage. Uh, but that's also what makes it <laughs> can make it hard. Um, and in writing that, I said, you know, I'm looking at all these trees up close, but I don't want to miss the forest for the trees and some of the big picture stuff. So I uh, wrote the second book, which is kind of a Pauline spirituality. And, um, and while I have these books up, I want to give a shout out to our my friends from Paul. If Bob Burns is here, uh, these are folks sitting over to, well, I see Paul McMahon. I'm sorry, Paul McMahon. Paul was my copy editor for both those books. And then um, the third book, Donna Crilly, who um, was copy editor and COVID has affected a lot of things, including paper supply and boy, did Donna keep things moving. And I put myself into a potentially embarrassing situation, which we set the date for the book launch and with the book <laughs> actually out, but Donna saw that it was, and I'm, I'm grateful to them for that. Um, it's been a great collaboration. So, I got to thinking, well, what about the rest of the New Testament? And that's what led me to think about I want to do a similar kind of book that sets forth how these books present Jesus and how they set forth the life of discipleship. How do we follow Jesus? And basically, the idea was, in effect, to create a New Testament spirituality uh, volume through these three volumes. And in the early summer of... 2019. I went out to Campion Center, which is out in West, and this is where uh, the retired Jesuits are, it's also an infirmary and a retreat center. And I took, the only book I took with me was a New Testament, and I spent one day on each of these texts, and I just prayed the texts, read them, thought about them, prayed with them, and at the end of the day, and I outlined what I wanted to do with them. And I, I, I say this in part because I want to thank my Jesuit brothers at a Campion Center for hosting me. But I want to communicate that while I've received very good training as a Jesuit in my formation and getting professional training to be a New Testament scholar, this book comes as much out of prayer as it does scholarship. And I think the book I say is better for, for my doing that. So let's uh, get to scooting. So I call the book Le Text Less Travel. It covers Hebrews, the Catholic epistles. So we're talking about James, uh, first and second Peter, for second and third John, and then the book of Revelation. And I call it Text Less Travel because these are texts that at least many Catholics don't really encounter that frequently. And I think there's three reasons for that. One is they're relegated to the end of the New Testament canon. If you open up a table of contents, uh, 
we start with the Gospels, and then we had the uh, Acts of the Apostles, the story of the early church, which ends with this note that Paul had been uh, was imprisoned in Rome, but proclaiming the gospel without hindrance. And that's a nice segue to the letter to the, he uh, to, the, letter to the Romans. And you have the whole Pauline corpus. Um, and it's not until you get past that that you get the Cat Hebrews, the Catholic epistles, and Revelations. That they're literally at the end of the table of contents. Um, in the church's liturgy, they don't receive much proclamation. It's usually in the context of the second reading and um, those of us who preach uh, the Catholic lectionary, the gospel is the Catholic canon within the canon. Notice you know, when we come to worship, we sit down, we hear the first reading, which is usually from the Old Testament. Word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We hear the Second reading from one of the epistles, thanks be to God. Then we stand up and we sing hallelujah, and sometimes we read from a different book, and it's only certain people who are privileged to proclaim the gospel, deacons and priests. So that's our canon within the canon, and that reading is, is synced or coordinated with the first reading. The second reading is on its own cycle. Point being that it's hard to preach on the second reading often, and it's a shame because we rarely... Uh, people don't hear much about these books. So I, I got this idea of that, uh, how can I talk about them? And I read a book review in the New York Times on uh, Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, the most misunderstood poem in America. And it's interesting. I said, oh, I think I've got an idea here. I mean, text less traveled. And what I learned from reading this review was when we think of the road less, when we think of that poem, at least my understanding of it always was, and I think the way a lot of us understand it, is the less traveled road that made all the difference. That's the way you, you take a risk. You, you don't follow the crowd. You go on your own. It's um, kind of staking your own way, and, and that's what made all the difference. Um, but what this literary cr uh, critic, David Orr, was pointing out, he pointed out a couple of things. One is there's a few indications in the text that that day both uh, paths lay evenly trodden. And there's actually two notices like that. And then it's at the end of the poem that the author projects himself forward and looking back in time, reflecting on this walk in the woods. And... Ms. Arthur says, well, this poem's really about how we, in retrospect, look back at our lives and tell the story of our lives in ways that make sense of the decisions we've made. And I thought, that's interesting. So I talk about this a little bit in my uh, introduction. I said, you know, if a poem about a walk in the woods has evoked so much thought and interpretation and possible meanings. How much more should we spend time with um, these texts that Christians consider to be divine revelation and really wrestle with them? And so uh, my point, you know, I, I try to entice my reader, these texts less traveled, uh, they might not make all the difference, but especially when we focus on things we wouldn't have without them, we're going to find out they make a significant difference or can in our lives of faith. So that's how the title uh, came about. So Hebrews, I start with Hebrews. And tonight, what I'd like to just focus on, I'm not going to read the book to you, don't worry. Because um, I want you to buy it. Um, I'm, I'm really going to focus on things that are unique to these texts that fill out uh, the New Testament presentation that we things that we wouldn't have if we didn't have these texts. So Hebrews has a very rich portrait of who Jesus is, and uh, one of the descriptions, he's the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Now, someone, someone from Nebraska uh, who grew up pretty close to where the Oregon and Mormon trails went, and we know what pioneers are. You know, what's a pioneer is somebody who goes in front, it's the first one, blazing a trail for others. And it's a beautiful description of Jesus 
who, in his humanity, lived a life of faithfulness that was perfected his obedience, as we see that second bullet point. I think he uses some very striking language. He learned. We don't think of Jesus sometimes as needing to learn. He learned obedience from what he suffered and was made per perfect. It's not to, to say that he had been disobedient or imperfect, but that his life of faith perfected in his self-offering for the sake of the glory set before him. I'm going to come back to that point here shortly. Um, He's also described, and probably the most unique feature of Hebrews is, and one of the reasons it's, it's a difficult text is it draws a lot upon Jewish cultic imagery with which many Christians aren't familiar, especially the uh, celebration of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And Jesus is presented as the high priest who doesn't take the blood of animals, but his own blood, doesn't take him to the earthly sanctuary, but the heavenly sanctuary. Um, and he's not only the priest, but he's the sacrifice. But he's also portrayed as reigning in heaven next to God. And his high priesthood is not just in his sacrifice on the cross for our salvation, but also he is described very beautifully. He knows what it's like to be human. He's walked in our shoes. He can sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he himself was human. And that we can approach the throne of grace with great confidence to receive mercy and help in time of need, as he says in chapter 4, verse 16. It's a beautiful image of uh, Jesus and one that we can continue to take great consolation in. Uh, Hebrews also says some interesting things about the church. It's uh, from Hebrews that Vatican II's document, uh, Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, has a chapter called The Pilgrim People. And it's largely from Hebrews' depiction of the Christian life as sojourners uh, on, on a way and moving, sojourning through this life to, towards heaven. It's in this letter that we get the only definition of faith in the New Testament. Um, and it's interesting how it's defined. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And as I work through all these texts, I think this definition works pretty well for a lot of these letters. It's conviction of things. It, it, notice how faith here is really defined in terms of hope, moving towards a future, not something right before our, our eyes. So it calls for trust. First of all, belief in God and God's promises, trust in God to be faithful. And... That's how Jesus is presented, as one who endured the cross for the sake of the glory that awaited him. Um, when I teach Hebrews, we, chapter 11 is this uh, encomium on the great heroes from the Old Testament. I call it the, Hall of Fame, the Jewish Hall of Fame, Faithful Witnesses. And here, um, I like to just highlight the figure of Abraham is prominent here. Why? Because he was called to be a sojourner. He was called to leave his homeland followed God's call into a new land. Um, he was promised a child. Here he is in his 80s and his wife, way beyond childbearing, trusted in God, believed in God. And that promise was fulfilled. Then he's asked to sacrifice that son. And he was willing to do so. Why? Because he, he reckoned, he figured that God was able to raise people even from the dead. Um, so we see this notion of resurrection faith that is uh, the hope that serves as the horizon uh, towards which we are moving. Um, the other thing I'd say about Hebrews that's kind of unique is in 
chapter 13, the last chapter, the language of paideia is very, or, or, and, and words from that. Paideia is basically the instruction of a young person, of a child. Now this doesn't sit well in contemporary ears, but um, quotes Proverbs and how a loving father disciplines his son. And that, and, and part of that discipline can be through, through suffering and um, there's teaching. In, but what, what's behind paideia, the notion of paideia is the love a parent has for a child that wants the very best for that child and to bring forth and to lead, to teach, to discipline in a way that will help that child to mature and to flourish. And, but how do we talk about in discipline today? And so uh, it strikes me that, and you're going to see my Jesuit identity kind of come through here, that the notion of spiritual exercise is very helpful. Um, to be an athlete to, or to be in good physical shape, one has to have discipline, right? Discipline the body, we have to be disciplined about our eating, to exercise, to work ourselves, to push ourselves. Um, well, spiritual exercises, things like taking the time in prayer and to listen in prayer, um, to grow in virtue, um, those things we do, uh, that takes time, it takes, it takes its own effort and so I think there's a way, and I try to, I'm just giving a little tease here, I suggest ways that we can think of how God can lead us in the way of paideia um, today. So let me, the other, there's two other things I want to say about Hebrews. Hebrews gives us two passages that are uh, kind of famous and I think very powerful. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. Now, that's a pretty um, powerful description. God's word as especially communicated through scripture. And what this image also tells us is how God's word, when we say yes to it, dwells within us intimately, uh, within us. And that's a... Um, this is Hebrews' way, I think, of talking really about the abiding of God's spirit within us. But it's the next passage that's always struck me, um, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. We're told that through his death, Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and to deliver those who, through fear of death, had been subject to lifelong bondage. Now, that's quite a statement. But I, I put it up there and I talk about it in the book because I think it's really worth reflecting on. Because when I think, and I'll just speak personally here, or, um, when I reflect upon my own life and as a priest, you hear people tell their stories, you hear confessions. Um, what is it, why do we do things that ultimately um, can be at least harmful to ourselves or can be considered sinful. I think it's because we try to fill ourselves with things that we think will give us life, whether that's food or drink, whether that's things we take in through our eyes, um, be any number of things. I think it's our fear of death, our reckoning with mortality that leads us to, and this is an image from Genesis, like Adam grasping after life where it's not offered to us. And this is a powerful thing. Jesus frees us from that because he himself died and is raised and we live in resurrection hope. Uh, I mean, think of people who get into bad habits that become addictions. Okay. And I'm not saying addiction is sin, but... We, there's many ways in which we become unfree, held bondage. And 
I think is a powerful statement about the way that we're redeemed by Christ. So that's uh, Hebrews. James, letter James, and I was sharing with Anne-Marie, uh, we're talking uh, before the lecture here, and I think this is my best chapter in the book, if I may say, so he said, he said modestly, best chapter in this book is chapter two. And that's not an accident, I you notice the theo there is in italics, uh, theos is the word for God in Greek, so theology is the study of God. And James sets forth a theology and the entire, you, you can't understand the letter and the logic of the letter unless you understand what he's saying about God. So he says some interesting things about God at, toward the beginning. He says, every good endowment and perfect gift is from above, coming from the father of, of lights. And he goes on to talk about God as unchanging and um, it's, it sets forth God's transcendence, but also that God is a father who, as a parent, wanting to uh, nurture, endow, and give gifts. Um, God is generous. God is not stingy with gifts. He also talks, it's in this letter that, uh, this is the writing, perhaps with Luke's gospel, that gives the biblical basis of God's love, special love for the poor. Um, and this God who's described as transcendent is also merciful and compassionate, involved with people and people's lives. Now I put these two little caveats. Uh, some of you may remember a couple years ago, Pope Francis created quite a stir when he suggested that we should change the wording of a petition in the Lord's Prayer from lead us not into temptation to let us not fall into temptation. He says, God the Father doesn't tempt. Now, this created quite a stir. I remember it was a Saturday morning. I was in my office, and I had this email from Jim Martin, and it was pretty urgent. He said, he said the Pope's come out with this, and, and all holy heck is being raised. He said, do you have any comments on that? And I, so I stopped and thought about it. Part of the issue here is the translation of the Greek is the same word that can be rendered temptation in the sense of leading somebody to sin. That same word can be rendered test. And there is a, the biblical notion of uh, being tested, uh, but being tempted towards sin, that is theologically problematic. And I wrote back to, to Jim Martin, I said, well, Pope Francis certainly has an ally in the letter of James. Because James makes clear, God cannot be tempted, and God tempts no one. The other uh, little uh, caveat is, if you get a chance when you get home, take a look at your translation of James chapter 4, verse 5, because it will say something to the effect that, does the scripture speak in, scripture doesn't speak in vain, does it? When it says, um, God... The spirit, uh, or, or God jealously guards the spirit within us, or the spirit. And the problem, and I learned this from my teacher, Luke Timothy Johnson. He said that is really a problematic way of putting things because the word, the Greek word thanos, is categorically negative. It's a vice, it's envy. And to attribute envy to God is wrong. So he suggested, and also it, it's, it's introduced by this, the scripture said, or the scripture doesn't speak in vain, does it? And it's usually that line is put in quotation marks as if it's from scripture, but there's no scripture passage. There. there is a scripture passage that immediately follows where it says, God lifts up the humble and opposes the proud. So he suggested that we interpret this as two rhetorical questions both of which expect the answer of no. Scripture doesn't speak in vain, does it? God doesn't place within us an envious spirit, does he? And then it goes on to cite the text. The reason this is important is, um, I'm going to come back to why that's important. I want to talk about the Christology of James. 
Um, one of the odd features about James is the name Jesus Christ appears only twice, the whole letter. And the first instance is in chapter 1, verse 1, where James identifies himself as the center of life. James, a servant or slave of Jesus Christ. It's only mentioned one other time. Uh, the peculiar. Martin Luther uh, famously assessed James as an epistle of straw, by which he meant there's not much substance to it. And one of the reasons was he did not find, he said, it does not show me Jesus. And at a certain level, you can understand that because, as I tell my students when I teach James, if we only had James, if we didn't have anything else in the New Testament, and you were asked to write in a seminar, well, tell us about this Jesus, you wouldn't have much to say. Okay. Um, another reason, and I'll talk more about this more shortly, that James, I'm sorry, that Martin Luther didn't like what James had to say was he thought that James was uh, contradicting Paul's teaching on the centrality of faith because James insists on the importance of works with faith and it was thought to be um, contradicting Paul. Now we can talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but what I've come to appreciate is that while Jesus himself isn't named much or described, what comes through this text is Jesus' voice. And it's really striking how many teachings from the Sermon on the Mount either get cited or at least alluded to. Let your yes me yes. Be doers of the word, not just it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord. Be doers of the word. Um, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers, James. And then uh, in, in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, you have the woes, like, just like the prophets say, blessed are those that are poor. Woe to the rich. And James rails against uh, those whose wealth is at the expense of uh, their workers or at the ex uh, through exploitation or, uh, of others. So I think the voice of Jesus is there, which is one of the reasons why in, in the book, I, I don't make a big argument for this, but I think James might be as early a work as we have in the New Testament because I say that for two reasons. One is toward the end, he says, you know, uh, the Messiah is waiting, knocking at the door. He's coming soon. That eschatological urgency that you see in Paul's writings, which are the earliest of the writings, but also um, something that no one has ever seen, at least in this, uh, the Gospels. Uh, we're going to take a little detour here for just a second from the road less travel, a little detour. Um, Mark's gospel is thought to be the first gospel in, in Luke and Matthew and second editions of that gospel. And they, in Matthew and Luke, you find uh, passages that look pretty much the same that aren't in Mark's called the double tradition. And scholars hypothesize that they're using another, a second common source called the Q source. And what it basically is is sayings of Jesus. So isn't it interesting that it, James, what he's giving us are sayings of, of Jesus. Now that's neither here nor there, but it's um, an interesting, makes it interesting to, to me. Now, he also talks about something called the royal law. And I think what James is really setting forth, and this is a wisdom text. Um, he's setting forth, I would render the royal law as kingdom law, the adjective is basilikos, from which same root as basil, basilus, basileia, which usually gets translated king, kingdom. It's the kingdom law that Jesus set forth in his own teaching and in how he embodied that, really living out the, the beatitude. So I would say contra Martin Luther, who knew, I'm sure he forgot more Greek than I, <laughs> I know he was a very learned man, but I, I think he, he didn't appreciate what James had to offer in terms of teaching about Jesus. As a matter of fact, I found this little 
uh, picture of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sharing this with you. I meant to put that on a little bit earlier so you didn't have to just look at text. Um, I have a magnet on my file cabinet that's given to me by my dear friend and mentor, Dan Harrington, late Dan Harrington. It has this image, and there's a little uh, saying in the upper left-hand corner. Jesus says, listen up. I don't want four different versions of this going out. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, we can be grateful we got the four different versions. But, um, in terms of Christian life, James gives us a definition of, and boy, this sounds very Jewish, doesn't it? Because you read the Old Testament and the prophets set forth, how, how does Israel know it's doing what it should be doing? It's how sensitive and caring they are to the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, the widows, and the orphans. James says, here's true religion. Visit orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. Um, James has a series of what I call little mini lectures or essays in this letter, one of which is uh, illustrates how faith has to be put forth in practice. He says, if you see a brother or sister who's ill-clad and hungry, it's not enough to say to them, I'm going to pray for your, you know, hope you get something to eat and drink, especially when you have the wherewithal to do something. Faith, he says, is not just a matter of belief. He says, the demons believe in God. They shudder <laughs> in terror. It's not just enough to, to believe, it's to live out faith, to, to, to live um, in ways that embody what Jesus did in his ministry. Uh, I do want to say a word that, again, I think Luther didn't get James, understand what James was getting at. Paul does distinguish between the importance of faith and works, but not just works in general works of the law. He uses that phrase, erga nom. And what he's referring to are those things that um, Jews do to identify themselves as Jews. So circumcision, observe the Sabbath, and, and dietary laws, which is true today. Catholics do things that mark us as Catholics, right? Um, he's this whole thing in, in Paul about the importance of faith, not works of the law. He's writing predominantly to Gentiles who weren't Jewish. And in the early church, there was a battle. We were hearing this played out in, in the Acts of the Apostles. How do you bring the Gentiles into the people of God? You know, the, the early Christians were Jewish. And to be part of the people of God, be part of the covenant, certainly. Think of these stories we're hearing from the Acts of the Apostles, how important the temple is. You know, they're still going to the temple to pray and whatnot. So how do you bring these people in? And Paul's point was, they don't have to become Jews to become Christ believers. That's, that's his, his point. He's not saying the life works aren't important. He's saying it's our faith in Christ and Christ's own faithfulness that brings us salvation. In Galatians 5, 6, he says, what matters most is faith working itself out, using that same root, in love. James and Paul say the same thing. They're, they're teaching the same thing. So to contrast them. Um, chapter 3 of James, I must say, and I was writing, working on this it was during the 2012, or I'm sorry, the 2020 election. And there's a lot of rhetoric going on and whatnot. James 3 about the use of the tongue. He, James says that tongue's a little thing, but boy, does it wreak havoc. He says, you know, you can get uh, a bridle or a, a bit. With a bit, you can control a horse. With a little rudder, you can steer a big ship. Because the tongue's also a very little thing, but very, very powerful. But often its power is enacted in ways that are harmful. 
And he says something that, uh, well, at the beginning of this chapter, he says, those who teach, those who preach will be held to a higher account. Um, he himself is a teacher, so he's, he's in that. But what he's really insisting upon is the power of the word to build up and the power of the word to destroy it. And he's making the case. How do we use, how do we use our words? How do we communicate? And it's not just what we say with our, with our tongues, but also, you know, thumbs and fingers on social media. And think back 2020, what was going on. And, um, but it's also a commitment to the truth. You know, things like uh, misinformation, disinformation, or you know, publicly insulting other people. This is this is the type of thing that the tongue and James says is dangerous. You're well on the road to spiritual maturity when you master the tongue and use the tongue and use words that show forth who we are. I said theology is important for James, who God is, because James reminds us we're created in God's image. And how God is impacts or informs who we are. James says in this chapter, the same, with, with the same tongue, we bless God and we denigrate, we curse our neighbor. He just said, ought not to be. One creating God's image and likeness. That ought not to be. And but I would say what he's really inviting us to do is to reflect upon how God, in whose image we're created, think of God, how God's word is presented at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis. God speaks, and what God speaks comes into being, it brings forth life. God's word is a life giving word. Or think of Jesus as the word made flesh. Now this is going beyond James. The Word made flesh. Jesus is the self-revelation of God. What does it mean for us to be creating God's image, whose own Word was life creating, and to be disciples of the Word made flesh and followers of this Word, to be committed to the way, the truth, and the life? I'm using joy language. It's very, very good. And very, I find it very challenging. Um, James also speaks of... I mentioned uh, not being uh, in league with the world. He says there's two, there's two kinds of wisdom. There's a wisdom from above, which is marked by purity, gentleness, docility. Um, and there's the spirit of the world, or the wisdom of the world, I should say. And that's marked by, it has two characteristics ambition, selfish ambition, and, and jealousy. And here he's contrasting two worldviews. One is God, who's a generous giver of gifts, before whom we all stand like this. Everything we have from God, gift from God. My ability to stand before you, my, as I teach, or I used to be at a parish where I had children, uh, a children's mass, and when I would try to get this point across, I said, who, who slept last night? Of course, they all raised their hand. And I said, you know, our heart's like this. I, you know, have them pump their hands. I said, who kept your heart pumping last night when you're sleeping? Was it you? No. Who kept your lungs functioning process? You know, I'm trying to get them to understand life is a gift. And God is generous. God is not stingy. The wisdom from below considers the world a and closed system, limited goods. If you have something that I don't have that makes me envious and jealous, you're no longer a fellow image of God. You start becoming a competitor, even an enemy. Okay. And James is really big. He can't be, he, 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 he really excoriates the double-minded. Those who claim friendship with God but live by the values of the world. Just can't have it both ways. Um, so this is pretty powerful stuff that I think it really speaks uh, in a contemporary way. Friendships a bit was a big theme in the important theme in, in the ancient world. The book of Sirach has a long treatise on 
friendship. Aristotle, I think it's, it's a Nicomachean ethics that's it's really about uh, friendship. And then Cicero wrote a long treatise on friendship. It, and there are maxims about friends. Friends are of one soul. Friends share all things. Um, friends have common values. And so now we're not equals with God, but to be a friend of God is to take on more and more his values. To love the poor, to be generous. Um, so James is a pretty challenging read. And then he has these, uh, this section in the letter where he's warning against arrogance. And the, the extreme arrogance are those who... Uh, James was pretty suspicious, I think, of the gaining of wealth. He says, woe to those who, uh, whose wealth is because they've exploited their workers. He said, the, uh, the cries of the poor have reached my ears. He said, what you've worked for, life is more than having. Life is really about being. Uh, so he excoriates the, the rich. That's pretty easy to understand, that kind of arrogance. A more subtle form of arrogance he teaches, you know, he, he gives this little vignette of somebody who plans, I'm going to go to such, an, I'm going to go to such and such a city for a year. I'm going to make money. And, and James condemns that. Why? It's no reference to God. No reference to anyone else. It's all about me, 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 and what I'm going to do. And he says, you don't even know you're going to be around. You're just a mist. Life is a gift. So he's, he's, he's challenging, and, and I can fall into this, believe me, before my illness. You know, when you're disciplined and get things, and you can kind of become the god of your life or think you've, <laughs> you're running the show, and we're not. Uh, he reminds us of that. But there's another form of um, arrogance that, and I allude in my book to the story of Nathan the prophet. You know, Nathan is the prophet at the time of David. David... Um, had relations with Bathsheba. She was, became pregnant. What to do? Well, he has um, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed. And so the prophet comes to David and says, you know, there's this man who had flocks and herds, plenty of cow, and there was neighbor was a poor man who had one ewe lamb. And a visitor came. And why did the rich man do? He didn't kill his own fox. He took the ewe lamb, the only possession of the neighbor, killed it and fed it. And David got very angry. He said, that man deserves death to be killed. And Nathan says, you are the man. Okay. James does something similar to us because most of us don't exploit our workers. And I think most of us aren't, aren't real arrogant. But he talks about another kind of arrogant. He says... You who judge and condemn others. Who are you to do that? Only God is judge. <laughs> you are the... Uh, and I think James' fundamental point is, yes, we are to be like God. Be like God in that God is generous with us. We should be generous with others. God is merciful and forgiving to us. We should be merciful and forgiving to others. Judgment and condemnation are divine prerogatives. That's for God to do. God knows what's in the human heart. We don't. So James gives, that's, that's what I mean by his prophetic edge there. Um, so, I'm going to see how we're doing time-wise. Okay. We're doing just fine. First and second Peter, this was, uh, uh, these are parts of the scripture I don't uh, spend a lot of time with, so it's good for me to really have to work through this. And one of the features of, this letter is how it presents Jesus as the suffering servant. As a matter of fact, he's really aligned with um, uh, that figure, not Isaiah, especially Isaiah 53. Now, by happenstance, or maybe coincidence or providence, today in the church's Catholic Church's liturgy, we heard from the Acts of the Apostles the story of the Ethiopian uh, eunuch who was reading the scripture, and Philip one of the deacons uh, is inspired to go. He's told, go up to that carriage. And this guy's reading the text from Isaiah 53. And Philip asks him, uh, 
do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless somebody explains it? And Philip explains it's God. It's God, Jesus. Jesus is a suffering servant who through suffering God has brought life and forgiveness. But what's unique about Peter's presentation, because I would say this is a contested point, Peter's not the only one who's using the suffering servant to interpret Jesus. Is that way in the Gospels? I would say that it's quite possible Jesus himself understood himself via when he says, you know, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That seems to echo the servant song. Um, Peter sets forth Jesus as one through whose suffering we have salvation, but also as an example to follow. Now, that can be uh, very difficult. Like the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus teaches, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors, and even turn the other cheek. Those are some of the hardest, if not the hardest, teachings of Christian discipleship. Peter picks up on this. Now, he's writing in a context, and here's where we have to be careful. Uh, the communities to which he was writing, there were slaves who were believers who could be summarily beaten by their master. Okay. Now, we don't have that situation today. Um, and I was really struggling with how would I talk about suffering? Um, it's easy to tell other people how to <laughs> make sense of their suffering. Um, so I was halfway through the book, and halfway through this chapter, I just had typed a subheading or a section heading participation in the Paschal mystery. Participation in the Paschal mystery, I'll explain that here in a second. And that was the day I wasn't feeling something wasn't right. Uh, the short of it is, is uh, that night I ended up in the emergency room in the hospital and eventually ended up at Brigham Women's Hospital. That's that very day and night. That's, uh, I was feeling odd and I was having some pain um, at the hospital. So this book was on hold for two years because initially I wasn't able to get back to it, but then secondly, it was pretty raw because what I wanted to get at, what Peter gives us a way of thinking about is how, you know, to be human is to suffer. He's talking about different kinds of suffering. Suffering as a Christian, and that happens in places in the world today can happen to us if, you know, to take stances for life against, uh, uh, you know, against war can lead one to opposition and to suffering from one can, um, but to be human is also to suffer, suffer diminishment, illness, um, relationship wounds. Peter gives us ways of thinking about um, how we can find meaning in suffering by aligning them with Je or offering them to God as Jesus offered his sufferings or offering our sufferings. And I want to tell a quick story when with Dr. Smith, because he, he knew I was a priest, he knew I was, he knew I was a Catholic. When I went with Father Bowton, to see Dr. Smith to go over the biopsy. We had a pretty a sense of what we were dealing with, but that this was the day he found out. And he asked me a question that I found kind of peculiar. Um, he said, in the Catholic Church, how is it that people become saints? And I said, what's this? It took me a little while to figure out what he's getting at, but basically what I eventually realized, I think Michael helped me <laughs> realize, um, I, I'm gonna need a miracle. I'm going to be healed. And so um, Michael asked me in the car coming. I mean, he was, he, he also assured me, Dr. Smith, that is, that I was going to get the best care and the best shot. He sent me to Dr. Ricky as part of that in my treatment. And I'm, here I am almost three years later living proof that I'm getting very, very good care. Um, Michael asked me, is there somebody you would like us to pray to intercede for my healing? for whom a miracle might make him a saint, for her a saint. And I said, Father Walter Chiswick, without hesitation. So we've been praying to Walter Chiswick. Walter Chiswick was a Polish-American Jesuit 
who wanted to work in Eastern Europe and was in Poland um, and the part of Poland that the Soviet Union took control of and he was arrested as a Vatican spy and spent a number of years in um, isolation in Lubyanka, terrible prison in Moscow, and then was shipped out to Siberia and had to work in the gulags. And he was a strong guy, physically strong. Uh, he wrote about this. Uh, he wrote a book called With God in Russia, and then the, kind of the he rewrote that in a book called He Leadeth Me, in which he really just reflects upon his, how he processed this whole thing spiritually. And he was a man of strong faith. He found God's will in dire circumstances. Um, the provincial got a phone call one day from the State Department. He was given up for dead. Nobody had heard from him for years. The provincial got a call from the State Department. Uh, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union are having a prisoner swap, a spy swap, and one of the people coming back is Father Walter Chiswick. <laughs> and here he came, and not an ounce of bitterness, not, uh, and he became, uh, he, he, he talked, he lectured, he was sought out as a uh, spiritual director, he gave retreats, people wrote him letters. Remarkable man never embittered, found God's uh, will through all of this. And there's a prayer from him that I was, was really taken by. And I think it's really in the spirit, the reason I'm going on and on about this, I think he captures First Peter and I do write about this. He says, Spirit of Christ, help me to accept the sadness in my heart as your will for me in this moment of time. I offered up in union with your son's sufferings for the redemption of the persons most in need. What he's setting forth is he believes that God can take some. What the Paschal mystery refers to is Jesus passes from death into life. And that, what does God, what does it say about God? God, the, the crucifixion and death of Jesus, an innocent man, terrible thing. What does God bring? God brings salvation, forgiveness of sins. He raises Jesus from the dead, vindicating what Jesus had revealed throughout his life. And it's the power of God, power of life over death. Sin doesn't win out. Grace can win out over sin. Joy has the last word, not sorrow. It's, it's belief in God. And to participate in the Paschal Mystery is to uh, enter into that dynamic of, um, of trusting in God to bring life out of death, but also offering one's sufferings in Union with Jesus, and and that's been very helpful to me personally. I mean, I can't say I suffer a lot. I'm in no pain. I'm getting the best care in the world. I remember uh, I meant to say this earlier. Uh, we had a, there was a great Jesuit, uh, Father Bob Manning, Robert Manning, who was the president of Western Jesuit School of Theology. He himself was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember him saying more than once to me, "Tom, Boston is a great city in which to get sick," and he would believe me. I know that now, um, best care in the world. But still, when faced with a kind of a devastating um, diagnosis and prognosis, um, I found a lot of meaning. And, and, and Peter, I think, leads us to that. Um, Peter also, I, I'll go a little more quickly here, um, he refers to Christians as living stones built on the cornerstone that is Christ. And then he refers, uh, alluding to the um, passage from the Exodus scene of the, uh, the priesthood of the people. And Lumen Gentium not only picked up on Hebrews, then we were a pilgrim people, but also uh, that all people baptized, are baptized in priesthood. It's, it's distinct from the ordained priesthood. They're complementary, um, but it's from Peter that we get the dignity of all Christians as participating in priesthood. Um, the word sanctification appears throughout this. Uh, sanctification refers to being made holy and living out of that holiness. 
It's been uh, suggested that this writing is a baptismal homily. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but it does set forth a way of imitating Christ, participating in the Paschal mystery. And part of that is uh, Christ's example as a suffering servant. And this, again, one has to be careful because we're not talking, um, people who are being abused, it, we ought not to say, you know, just suffer, suck it up. Um, Christians are called to stop abuse, to stop, you know, to, to stand up to that kind of violence. But um, there is a sense sometimes where um, we're kind of, we might be opposed and Violence begets violence. And what Jesus teaches, the only way to stop violence is for somebody to resist it uh, in peace, and, uh, and peacefully, not to strike back. Um, so that takes us to the Joy Nine letters. Um, and I want to just say a few words here about, <laughs> John makes theology pretty simple. The easiest word in English is a subject, linking verb, and a predicate. I am Tom. That's a pretty simple thing. Uh, there's two statements about God, linking verb, and a predicate in the New Testament. They both come from the Johannine letters. God is light. Light is what enables us to have life, right? Think of the sun. But even more, God is love. And when he says God is love, he's saying love is who God is and love is what God does. And that that love of God, as was the case of the Gospel of John, revealed most dramatically in the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus, God's word becoming flesh. And you think about that. What does it say? God holds nothing back in revealing love. Those of you who are parents can appreciate it, especially if you're a parent of an only child. God holds nothing. God gives his son to us, revealing himself. And Jesus, in revealing God's love, held nothing back. And while the foot washing scene is from John's gospel, which we hear proclaimed on Holy Thursday, uh, reminding us that the Eucharist is a gift and what the Eucharist empowers is to love as Jesus loved. You, know, you think about that scene. Jesus, who's hosting this banquet, gets up, takes off his outer tunic, puts a towel around his waist. He's, he's, he's putting on the garb of a slave, basin of water, or basin, pitcher of water. He's washing the disciples' feet. Now, today, you know, bottom of our feet are probably not what we would lead with in showing ourselves to others. Not the most, but think of a time in which they weren't wearing shoals back then. Think of those disciples walking up, and, uh, what those feet were like, and Jesus uh, tenderly and uh, lovingly washing feet. Peter objects because he sees how incommensurate this is, and Jesus says, "If you," it, he says, "If you don't allow me to wash your feet, you'll have no part in me." What Jesus is doing is he's, he's through a prophetic action, he's he's interpreting what he's going to do the next day on the cross, giving himself that we might have life. And giving. John says, Jesus loved his own, he loved them, a steal us to the very full extent. That's how Jesus reveals God's love, and, and, and these letters draw upon this. And it's in this letter that we have a very challenging saying. Say, you can't claim to love the God you can't see if you don't love the brother or sister whom you do see right next to you. And it's easy to love someone we don't see. When we're rubbing shoulders, and that can be a different story. But he's very, uh, John's very insistent upon love, and he uses the imagery of, of family for um, for the church or for the Christian community. And he says, "What a privilege it is." He says, "We're God's children." And he says, one day we'll see God face to face. We'll become like God. 
And the logic of these letters is um, we are by adoption why Jesus is by nature. So we're brothers and sisters of Jesus. And the Christian life is then about growing in the family likeness. You know, some families are distinguished by physical characteristics. You know, I mean, Smiths have a distinctive nose and the Johnsons that chin. Some are distinguished by vocational, you know. Those folks, and there is three lawyers in that family, um, some by disposition. I'm in Boston, so I don't say anything about the Irish and their stubbornness. But I'm German, I can, I can say the Germans have it. Um, but what's the family likeness here? Self-giving love, growing in the way of self-giving love and bringing about koinonia, communion, fellowship. John's very insistent on this, just as the gospel writer was because the, wit, the unity of the church, people loving, people aren't even related to them as brothers and sisters shows forth the power of the gospel as a way of proclaiming the gospel. Um, Megan's given me a signal I need to pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, so um, here I, I'm just going to give a tease. There's several paradoxes in the, the letters that speak so eloquently about koinonia also has people calling one another antichrist and leaving the community. You have schism in the early church. Uh, you have uh, people instructed not to give hospitality to certain emissaries. And, uh, and I'll just give a tease. I, I try to wrestle with that in the text because um, he also gives us ways out of that. Um, so, book of Revelation. <laughs> We're not going to do this justice. Um, there's two basic um, ways of people look at the book of uh, Revelation. For, and I grew up pretty close to the Bible Belt, and I know people who believe this. Some would say it's the most important writing in the New Testament. And the reason they say that is because it tells the future. So they think. That's what's going to happen in the future. And then others think it's best avoided because it's a hard thing to uh, understand. And the history of interpretation of this text is really uh, troubling. And I'll just give a recent example. Do you remember? The, when the Branch Davidian complex was uh, raided, the, the FBI and, or some government agency back in the 1970s, I think it was. And the leader of that group, David Koresh, among the things he claimed was he had the secret unlocking the seals that sealed the scroll. Book of Revelation has also been used to kind of try to decipher what's happening in history, and people uh, get it. You have the beast, you have the 666, and all this. Um, and my, my teacher, Luke Johnson, says what's really needed with people of God in the book of Revelation is good exegetical therapy. <laughs> so in, in the book, what I try to do is, first of all, set forth the historical context of this, because this is written in a time when Christians were being persecuted by the emperor Domitian, at least a certain part of the empire, and being encouraged. This is when worship, the, the emperor cult and the cultus of goddess was becoming more prominent in the empire. And you showed your loyalty. And there were a lot of local officials who were very happy to show their fealty to Rome by encouraging this cult, and, and Christians were being pressured to do this. And Domitian, there's no proof that he insisted upon this, but he was very wont to receive the titles Lord and God. Curios, uh, or Dominus, um, and Deus. And one of the questions in this book is, who is Lord and God? And uh, it makes pretty clear who this is. So. It's written in a specific time to encourage people. That's important to know, not because um, we leave the text in the past, but it's important to know what it was addressing. It's not just 
uh, telling us what the future is. And then also as an apocalypse, it's important to appreciate the literary genre of uh, apocalypse. And I hope I do a good job of this in the book because uh, that's something we're not familiar with. It's from this book that we have one of the most famous images of Jesus in chapter three, verse 22. I stand at the door knocking and the one who opens the door, I will enter and sit down and table and eat with him or her and she, he, he will eat with me. Beautiful image. Jesus wanting, knocking the door of our hearts. Love doesn't coerce, doesn't act violently. Love invites. And that image of being, he literally wants to be our companion, one who, with whom we break bread. Another thing about this book is the importance of worship and prayer. And as with other apocalypses, the seer, John of Patmos, is taken up in the heavens and he sees the heavenly worship, which um, the author suggests where we can participate in. Um, and what this book really sets forth is the importance of worship. Christians were being pressured to show their fealty to Rome by offering worship to the emperor. Um, think about it today. We don't have necessarily, we're not asked to worship Caesar, but there's a lot of ideologies out there. There's a lot of in you know, I would even say within our political parties, there's a lot of things. You either, there's some absolutes we're called to buy into. And, and many of them are in tension with and odds with the gospel. This is a, a writing that really challenges us. And worship is, I don't want to say it's a political act, but it's an important thing to do to show to whom we give our fealty and loyalty to God, the maker of all, not any of the these other competing voices around us. And it's also a way to um, kind of uh, keep ourselves from idolatry. And, you know, uh, there aren't many idols around, but idolatry is alive and well. And what I mean by that is, you know, you just ask yourself, with my discretionary time and, and, and things, you know, why do I, what would I use that on? Or why, why do I find myself really wanting, focusing on life. And oftentimes those answers is not God. It might be status, it might be wealth, it might be something. It could be a, a relationship too. So the importance of that. Um, it's from the book of Revelation that the church has, uh, draws prayer text from. Very important. I, I talk about that. And the last of those hymns talks about uh, um, Christ having a bride, and the bride is uh, the new Jerusalem. And I'm just going to, the whole Bible, not just this writing, the whole Bible ends with a description of the new Jerusalem. And we ought not to take that so much literally as it's described as a city. In the ancient world, cities were where you would be safe, secure. The size of the city is basically the size of the Mediterranean world, which was the world John of Patmos knew. Um, and that should remind us that, because this is really a description of heaven, it is, there's plenty of space. And heaven is not just me and God. There's going to be a lot of people, probably a lot of people I might be surprised. Um, but that calls forth, I think it should give us pause to reflect, well, how do we regard others? It's also, there's nature in this place. There's the, the water of life, or the river streaming forth, tree of life. Nature's part of this. And as Paul says in Romans 8, and I think we should give some thought to that and think about what the Pope is calling us to, common care of our, our, care of our common home. And this is a city that has no need for the sun to shine because God is present. And so there's not light or a day or night. What is that saying? It's saying, first of all, God is the source of light. But secondly, there's no time. How do you, how do you tell the passing of time if there's no change of, he's talking about eternity. And right in the middle of the city, it's not a temple. It's the very presence of God. And that's the image of eternal life being in the presence of God, where there's no more death, there's no more weeping, no more tears. It's the best of human culture, culture gathered around God. It's not just me and God, it's 
all this, the people of God, in the presence of God. So, um, with that, that's that's the book. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't discipline myself real well, but we do have time for some questions, comments. Megan heard me say this a hundred times. We save complaints to the very end, okay? That's, that's the only ground rule here. We have just one? Oh, we can do a few, can't we? It's mine. It's, I know, yeah. Well, I'm not the one. That's, that's the scary thing. Dad and my folks are watching from Elkhorn, Nebraska, my sister's place. Megan just said I was the boss, Dad. <laughs> questions or but my in my conclusions book I try to summarize some of these things we would be much poorer our Bible would be much poorer if we didn't have these these books and that's what I was really trying to, to accomplish and set forth um, so these are texts worth traveling becoming familiar with Any, anyone John just, uh, at, at the beginning of your talk uh, there was a a line about opening the door of faith. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. At the beginning of your talk, there was a line about opening the door of faith. And I thought I saw that very recently in the text from Acts for between the 16th and the 20th of May. And I talked about Paul opening the door of faith for the Gentiles, I think. Yes. I don't know, but I just wanted to know, is that related or is there anything? It's very, it's very related. I riffed, the, that title is actually taken from the um, document the, uh, from, or with which Benedict proclaimed the year of faith. And I can't remember the Latin, but uh, where's Brian? <laughs> Do you remember the name of that? Uh, it, it's basically um, the door of faith. And it explains in that text that is taken from that very passage in, in Acts of the Apostles. Thank you. So the Pope takes from Acts and I take from the Pope. And <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Was it all clear as mud? <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for coming in. Again, I want to. I want to thank my medical team. I dedicate this book to you because if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been able to finish the book. And I'm very grateful for that. And um, you honor us with your presence. So thank you. And all of you. Yeah. All of you honor me by your presence here.